allowed the Ask the Pastor questions to pile up. So I'm going to go through these today, get us all caught up. Next week we are talking about the relationship of uh, grandparents and grandchildren. I've got to give you a little teaser right now. Um, being a grandparent is way better. <laughs> oh yeah, and not just because you can, you know, bring them in, sugar them up, get them hyper, and send them home, which I love to do. <clears throat> but because you you don't have the stress and the burden of making sure they're perfect, mm -hmm. you know. Not necessarily true. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's that's not necessarily true. <laughs> There are those of us that, that seek to impart perfection to everyone else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, we will be talking about that next week. Um, if you gave an Ask the Pastor question last week, um, would you please rewrite it? I, I have no idea where it went. I had it with my papers. I got home and I went through the papers and it's gone. So if you turned in and asked the pastor question last week, please rewrite it and get it to me. Okay, so we are going to, there you are, gosh, you moved. Okay, this is the uh, other part of Diane's question. Thank you so much, Diane. I like to be challenged, but I don't like to not be able to figure certain things out. So, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got another one coming. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is talking about uh, relationships in the church. <clears throat> We've addressed this passage before. Uh, specifically, the question is in verse 10. Um, actually, I'm going to back up to 9. Uh, well, no, I'm going to back up to 8 so you can kind of get the context. Uh, so in verse 8, For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, don't, don't, get, don't get all uptight about this. Uh, go back and look at some of the other Ask the Pastor questions so you can kind of get some more insight into that. Now, verse 10... That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What does that mean? Because of the angels. I told her when she asked me, I don't know. <laughs> well, honestly, I don't. Um, the first thing that we need to do, we need to put this in context because we don't ever look at just one verse on its own. The, the context of the verse is significant and it's important. So we read what's before, we read what comes after. In this part of Corinthians, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church that had allowed certain practices into their service, into their body, that were not good, they were not beneficial. Uh, so we see that uh, going back several chapters, Paul is dealing with the issue of, of cheap grace. Uh, the Corinthian church had gotten to the point where they were actually proud of their acceptance of sin uh, because they thought that showed more grace and, and Paul tells them no, that that's actually not the case. Uh, you need to put the sinner out if he doesn't repent. Um, so he, he deals with that. Um, he comes into the, the order of the service uh, and the, the structure of the church. Um, in doing this, Paul makes two points concerning the body. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page. I looked up and it's verse 6. No! Here we go. Um, I do not have a good feel for these. I am not sure, but I'm going to give you my opinion, and you, you know what I think about opinions. Um, I think, uh, backing, backing up a few verses, we see in this chapter, Paul lays out what is called the hierarchy of authority. Okay? We see that God the Father is first, and then we see his Son is second, 
and then we see man, and then we see woman. Now, um, this hierarchy of authority is to be looked at as a covering, a protective thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, throughout a lot of the church, um, a lot, a large percentage of the church has taken this to mean um, men are in some way superior to women. Uh, women should be kept in their place. That is not at all what is being said here. Um, what is being told here is why the creation was created the way that it was. And, and we actually go all the way back to Genesis and we see that um, when the serpent deceived Eve and she ate the fruit, she not only sinned, but, but Adam actually sinned twice. Okay, Adam ate of the fruit, that everybody knows about that sin, but the other sin was he was the caretaker, the husband of all of God's creation, including Eve. And he didn't stop her. Okay? He didn't protect her. Scripture says, and she gave some to the man who was there with her. Okay? Now, I believe personally that this, this has trickled down. Um, this, this dynamic has trickled down into marriages, every marriage. Uh, we see that, that there will be contention between the two. Um, but moving on uh, from this, uh, he establishes this hierarchy. Um, um, now he's going down, and, and, and to be honest with you, um, here's something that I think we need to be very, very careful of in the church. We have a tendency to write off scriptures we don't like. Mm -hmm. Instead of dealing with them head on, we start to rationalize. We start to uh, color it in ways that we find more palatable. And the book of Corinthians, specifically 1 Corinthians, is one of the most often messed up theology in all of scripture because there are a lot of things that Paul is dealing with with the Corinthians and, and here's, here's what a lot of people say. Okay? They say, um, well, no, that was something specific to that church. Go back and read the intro. It says, and to all the churches everywhere. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Paul is not dealing with a narrow idea. He's actually taking something and he's applying it to the entire church. As a matter of fact, if you look in several of the passages that people really struggle with, he actually says, we have no other practice. This is the way it's done. Okay? Um, so people will go through and they'll pick in their choose and they'll say, well, um, just to give you a couple of examples, when we look in 1 Corinthians, what is probably one of the most divisive uh, passages in Scripture uh, Coming from 12 through 14, I'm sorry, my throat is really dry. <clears throat> Paul is dealing with gifts in the church and how they're to be used and how the church is to be structured. Um, he's, the, he takes a break in the middle of this because we get really caught up in the gifts, whether you are, are for all of them to excess or whether you're to none of them, we tend to get caught up in 12. And then 13, he, he takes a break and he says, now I will show you a better way. Okay? And he goes down and he lists love. He lists all of the, the, the gifts that he just talked about. And he says, if, they, if I don't have love in these, they're worthless. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the gift of prophecy, if you are not prophesying in love, it's worthless, okay? And then he comes down to the end of 13, um, and he actually, the way he wraps it up, I just want to read to you because he, it's a transition statement. Um, in verse uh, 11 he says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, his transition is this next verse. It's actually the first verse in 14. He says, pursue love. Run it down. Chase it. I hated tag. I, I did. I hated it especially when the girls played. Because there's nothing so embarrassing to a little boy as not being able to catch the last person until you go back to class, it. Yep. Okay? Um, and if you ever watch little kids play tag, it's a serious business. It is a serious business. And, and if somebody gets offended, they take their tag and go home. Okay? Um, we need to be serious about pursuing love. <laughs> and then he says, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And then he goes back into <clears throat> dealing with the order of the church, specifically as relates to particular gifts. Um, we need to remember that love is at the foundation of all that we're supposed to be doing. Whether it be, uh, as I saw this weekend, so many people pouring out love on uh, Richard's family and Mary Lou's family, um, sharing their grief with them, uh, helping them to say goodbye, uh, whether it be confronting someone in their sin and lovingly correcting them, okay? Uh, it's, the root of this is all love. And then we get down to 14, and people just get so weird. Um, <clears throat> chapter 14 especially, people start picking and choosing which verses are for today. And it's so funny because you talk at people on either end of the spectrum and they're disqualifying certain scriptures that they don't like on this side that these people insist is true. And then they insist that some scriptures don't apply that these people do. If we start denying scripture and excusing scripture, we put ourselves on a very slippery slope. Okay? If this was not intended for us, why is it in here? All scripture is God. Every word, every jot, every tittle, every bit. It's all God breathed. So I am very cautious when I hear people say, oh, that was for that church. They were dealing with a specific issue. Open your eyes, people. Every church deals with issues like this. If they're not, it's not a church. It's a country club. Okay? It's, it's, it's some kind of other organizational meeting. It is not church. Okay? So coming back, um, on this specific verse, um, last week we talked about chapter 6, verse 3, talking about judging the angels. Um, there are a couple passages that I think connect here. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, judging the angels. And, and last week I told you, I don't think it's an issue of we're going to sit on a throne and say, you're in, you're out. I think it's, it's in a measure we will have some authority over the angels because we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay? We're co-heirs. Um, I think the, the dynamic is this, and, and again, this is what I think, okay? Um, <clears throat> I think that the angels are amazed at our salvation. Because they don't get it. They don't understand it. That is not something that is given to them. That the Almighty God that they were created to serve would humble himself to coming to earth and dying for us, I think, is an amazing thing in their minds. Okay? Because you got to remember, before we ever rebelled, there was rebellion in heaven. Okay? And so I think that, that the angels are, are looking into something that they don't understand. Um, I think that there will be a, a restoring of order. 
uh, because, you know, we, we see in uh, Psalms that uh, what is man that are mindful of him, you have made him a little lower than the angels. And yet, in the New Testament, we're told that we will judge them. We know that the, there is a, a hierarchy in the angelic host. God is a God of order. He didn't just throw them all in a piddle and send them out. And just, there's order. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know that there are angels that minister day and night around the throne. We know that there are angels that always see the face of God. We know that there are angels that will bring messages. We know that there are angels that will fight. Okay? So we know there is some sort of order within the angelic host. Um, I think that they look at the hierarchy that we have. And they are amazed. Uh, and this reason, and because of the angels, um, I, I think they're looking at this, and this is a, a living testimony to them of our value to God. Okay? So take that as you will. Um, you got a better answer, I'm, I'm always willing to listen. Okay? So that's. Question one. Question two. All right. So this starts with the scenario. A father on a corner with his teenage son or daughter. Um, the son or daughter is holding a homemade banner that reads, I am a thief. What does God say about this? He is merciful and just. And there are two sides to this. Is the father right? Is the teenager being provoked to wrath by being shamed? Uh, there is a cast the first stone thought. Uh, the father could be holding up a sign as well, as we all can. Uh, children are to obey their parents and heed correction. Um, what, what, essentially, what do I think about this? What does God's word say about this and how do I see it? Um, specifically, scripture doesn't address this issue per se. But scripture has a lot to talk about the parent and child relationship, okay? Um, we know that uh, there are a number of Proverbs that speak of disciplining and even punishing your children um, as to uh, the need to correct for the spirit of foolishness. Uh, we are not to spare the rod. Um, um, we, we are to be diligent in how we discipline. Uh, I, I just want to say at this point, just so I'm very clear on this, uh, if you are punishing for any other reason than discipline's sake, uh, that's abuse. Okay? And we have to be very careful because a lot of parents punish because they're just mad. Okay? And the punishment does not merit the crime. Okay? And this is something that... As a, as a parent, I couldn't see very well, but as a grandparent, I can see it. Um, uh, you know, like I said, I, I'm not in any way committed to making sure they're perfect. That's, that's not my job anymore, okay? My job is to sit back and relax and laugh at my kids as they deal with their kids for all the things that they used to do, okay? That's, that's what I get to do now. Um, but I wanted, uh, there are a couple things here that I want to put this in the right perspective, okay? In Leviticus, Moses being led by God to write this, he says, for anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, his blood is upon them, okay? And then further, he says, uh, if any man has a stubborn or rebellious son, now let me, let me qualify this. Um, this is not specifically saying a father and a son. It, it's more the idea of a parent and a child because little girls can get in trouble too and sometimes moms have to deal with children. Um, so it, the, the, the context, putting this in the proper perspective is parent-child. Um, so if any man has a stubborn, 
and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them, then his father and mother shall seize him, and I, for some reason I always picture this by the ear, <laughs> and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown. They shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death. And so you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear of it and fear. Now, these two passages right here, uh, if the others don't satisfy you, these two passages should make it abundantly clear that God is serious about the family dynamic, parents and children. Uh, we know that, that parents have responsibilities, we know children have responsibilities, but um, you know, we obviously, we live in a very different culture. I may or may not have chucked rocks at my kid. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't remember doing it on purpose. But we, we've done a lot of rock throwing, so um, our culture doesn't allow this. Okay. <clears throat> but we need to understand it's in here for a purpose, okay? So, um, looking at this punishment, I think holding a sign isn't all that bad. However, um, as Christian parents, uh, well, parents in general, uh, have a responsibility to their children, but as Christian parents, we're given certain steps that we are to take with our children. We are to teach them and train them, we are to correct them, we are to provide for them, uh, and then again, uh, the, the verse that we've referred to before, we are not to in, incur them to wrath. Um, I believe, personally, I would not use this method of punishment, personally, okay? Um, and, and now that Thaddeus is 18, um, I probably won't have to deal with this with any of my kids, hopefully. Um, now, I, scripture does caution parents, specifically fathers, to, to not exasperate exasperate, oh good grief, to annoy their kids. <laughs> um, we have to balance that scripture with the rest of scripture because, um, you know, I, I am pretty sure that at a number of times um, I have exasperated my children um, with the things that I've done especially when it comes to punishment, because no child ever feels like they deserve what they're getting. I know I didn't. It wasn't my fault. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I, I, I am not culpable. <laughs> See, we just, we just got the age difference here. Okay? Okay? All right. So, um... <coughs> Scripture tells us that discipline is intended to be painful. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says, uh, uh, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay? Now, there, there are two responsibilities being laid here side by side. The responsibility of a parent to their children and the responsibility of the children to learn from their parent. And this is, this is actually put in the context of God disciplining us, but he's using the example of the earthly fathers and their children. Okay, so there's responsibility to the parents, there's responsibility to the children to learn. Okay, so um, we have to strive for that narrow path that balances 
loving, godly discipline without crossing over into, I had a horrible day at work, I got home, the dinner was burned, the, the program I wanted to watch got preempted because Texas floods every time it rains, so game seven of the Stanley Cup finals is not being shown. True story. <laughs> Let it go, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and so when your child spills his drink for the fourth time that meal you got to be cautious to make sure the punishment uh, is equal to the crime okay so uh, is this a proper punishment? What does scripture have to say about it? Quite honestly, every child is different. Every parent is different. Uh, like I said, I, I can't see that I would do this. Um, I don't think that uh, embarrass embarrassment is necessarily uh, the best way to deal with punishment. Um, but I can't say that nobody should ever do this because there might be a case where this would be the best answer. Okay, because the, the end goal is to correctively change the behavior of the child. Okay, so um, is this scriptural? Scripture doesn't address it one way or the other, but I, I see things in scripture that, uh, you know, seem to be relatively, uh, what, what we would consider in our society to be relatively minor, though he cursed his parents, uh, and, and there was a severe punishment for that. So, um, and by the way, I don't believe that is a one-time slip cease. I think that is a, a, a pattern of behavior that is being corrected, not a, um, you know, your, your dad made you angry and you said, you know, he's, he's um, his, his heritage is, is less than pristine. <laughs> All right, next question. I'm a pastor, I gotta find creative ways to say those things. <laughs> um, okay, so the scenario in this one is, um, and this is kind of interesting because yesterday we, we had the funerals. Um, the question is, uh, essentially, are those who have gone before us looking down from heaven on us? Okay, now, where in scripture is that found? So I'm gonna ask you this. Let me say all of it before you start checking things out. All right? Don't get up and leave. Okay? This, this thought, there are three passages that people use concerning this thought. The first one is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Um, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Okay? Um, now, if you remember the context of this, the writer of Hebrews has, is talking about faith, and then in chapter 11, he lists all the great men and women of faith, not all of them, but he gives us a, a, a list of all of the, the people of faith that have gone before us, and, and going on down, and, and what they did, and he even, he even actually gets to the bottom, and he said, you know, there, there's too many to even count. We can't, we can't tell you all of them because there's so many. Uh, and then he goes into uh, chapter 12, which starts, Therefore, therefore, when you see that at the start, that means you got to back up and read. you you, you got to back up and see why this is there in its proper context. So whenever you start a passage with therefore, you immediately got to back up and see what the therefore is there for. Okay? So... Um, the author of Hebrews is talking about um, faith, and I, I believe that in this passage, I, I don't think that um, Noah is checking me out right now. Okay. Um, I, I don't think Abraham is here looking at you. Okay. What I think is that being a witness 
is, is the example for us to follow them. They have established a pattern, a lifestyle of faith that we are being called to. Their faith was looking forward to a Messiah to come. Our faith is based on a Messiah that has come. All right, now going down, we have to read the rest of the verse. It says, because of this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, if we take this, this first part of the passage to mean that this cloud of witnesses is, is watching us, that would make them our judge. Because the, the rest of the verse indicates that we have to put stuff off so that we can run with endurance the, the course. That they're not our judge. They're, they're not, you know, when, when uh, we go before the throne, um, the only thing that is going to matter before the throne is the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? And then the judgment for rewards. Okay? Um, so, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. This is the, the entirety of the faith, the, the, the assembly of the faithful that we are now a part of. Okay? Um, they witness that God and God alone bring salvation. Okay? Now, two other passages that... Um, people look at. The first one is in Luke chapter 16. And if you remember, this is the parable that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay? And both of them have died. And they are in uh, Hades. Um, that place that people were sent before Jesus came and led the righteous out. Um, they were in uh, Hades, um, Lazarus was being comforted by Abraham uh, in what was known as Abraham's bosom. That was the side that wasn't so hot. I mean, it wasn't hot. Like, they, he wasn't a liar. Okay? And then across this great chasm uh, was the rich man who was on fire and, and it was burning. And he, he was asking that uh, Abraham would let Lazarus come over and, and put water on his tongue. Okay? Um, but then he says, um, send someone to my brothers so that they don't end up here. Okay? Um, now, we know the story that, that uh, Abraham answered him bluntly. Hey, look, if they're not listening to the word, they're not going to listen to a ghost. Okay? They have everything that's needed. Mm -hmm. And so, people will look at this and... and seem to indicate that he is seeing his brothers, but nowhere in here does it say that. Okay? He knows his brothers. And he knows his brothers are going to be coming down and joining him. They're not going to Abraham's bosom. Okay? Nowhere in this passage can you, without your own personal bias, insert that any of them were looking at people still alive on the planet. Okay? The, the third one is uh, Revelation, and uh, in this case, uh, we see that uh, the martyrs are calling out to God how much longer until we receive justice, okay? And they are ministered to. They're, they are given clothes of white raiment, and they are told for a little time yet until the full number of your brothers are brought in. So, so wait, just wait. Now again, there is no mention of them looking down on earth and, and seeing anything. Okay? The actual context is they are calling out to God to be the just God that he is. All right. Now, I've said all of those things. I want to flip the coin over. There is nothing in Scripture that says they don't. 
Okay? These, I, I believe these three passages are misinterpreted, but there's nothing in there that, that says they don't. We cannot definitively, we should not definitively say, nope, nor, yep, Scripture doesn't say. Personally, I think that uh, when I get to heaven, I, I believe my dad is going to be right there waiting to grab me, but he's going to be second in line. Okay? <laughs> Because, you know, Jesus gets first dibs. Right. right? And as uh, other family members come in, uh, we will, we're, we're, we're celebrating. This, this is a place, this is the eternity that God has promised to them that believe. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in the parable of the talents, uh, the master said, enter into your master's rest. That's, that's the four-letter word opposite to the other four-letter word that is work. Now, now, let me qualify that. Work as the curse made it, which is actually toil. Okay. So, um, do, do people up in heaven look down on us? Quite honestly, when I'm in heaven, I think there are going to be a lot of other things for me to look at. Uh, I, you know, I love my family. Um, I can't wait till we're all together in heaven and we can celebrate and we can be free of everything that, that impaired us on this earth. Uh, we will be unencumbered by sin. Uh, we will get to be who God truly made us to be. Um, but if, if I get there uh, before my family, there, there's going to be so much for me to look at. Uh, but I believe I will know when they come home. Okay, So... If it brings you comfort to think that your, your family members are looking down on you, amen. Yeah. There's nothing scripture says they don't. Rest in that. Okay? Um, if you're wrong, you're not going to find out till you get there. And it's not going to matter at that point anyway. Okay? Um, so if it brings you comfort, I, I just want to assure you, there's nothing scripture that says they don't. Okay? Fair?